Turtle Bay TV is made possible by Voya Financial and generous viewers like you. Australia, the land down under. It's home to some of the most fascinating places and wildlife, ranging from the Great Barrier Reef to koalas and kangaroos, or roos as we like to call them. It's incredibly diverse, from the beautiful beaches surrounding the nation to the rugged desert that spans the outback. Australia is Earth's smallest continent and it is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world. If you were coming from Redding, California, you'd have to travel over 8,000 miles crossing the vast Pacific Ocean to finally arrive, but by crikey, it'd be worth every mile. But why are we talking about Australia when Turtle Bay is in California? Well, California and Australia have many similarities and differences. Mainly, both are characterized by the Mediterranean climate. The concept of a Mediterranean climate is characterized by mild, wet winters and warm to hot, dry summers, which occur on the west side of each continent between about 30 degrees to 40 degrees latitude. There are five regions around the world that exhibit these unique characteristics. The Mediterranean Basin, Central Chile, the Cape region of South Africa, California, and southwestern and south Australia. In this episode of Turtle Bay TV, we'll explore the similarities and differences between Australia and California through the lens of the wildlife, native plants, environmental science and more. By the end, a land so far away may not seem so different. G'day there, Cobber. The name's Ross, and I live right here in the land down under and I'm excited for you to learn about my home. Let's explore some of the unique and dangerous animals that we've got here in Australia, discover why seasons and storms are different in the northern and the southern hemispheres, and check out a bunch of plants that thrive in the Mediterranean climate here in our botanical gardens. We're gonna learn some fun Australian words and plenty more, all on this episode of Turtle Bay TV. Welcome to Turtle Bay TV, your personal virtual experience of everything Turtle Bay Exploration Park has to offer, including animals. Daintree is a jungle carpet python. Distance learning. Oh, 36 pennies. Horticulture. They were in the nursery. Exhibitions and more. Welcome to the vault. To inspire wonder, exploration, and appreciation of our world. Now let's jump into this episode of Turtle Bay TV. Grab something to write with because it's time to go over our trivia questions. Number one, what are the two reasons that snakes strike? Number two, how long can lorikeets live? Finally, when it's summer in Reading, what season is it in Australia? Listen close and write down your answers and we'll go over them at the end. And keep an eye out for light bulbs, it means an answer's coming up at any moment. Whether you're hiking right here in our beautiful Northern California trails or taking a walkabout in the outback of Australia, you have traveled through the home of many animals, including snakes. Let's join Amanda and learn about snake bike kits, a piece of gear adventures of old wouldn't be caught without when traveling through snake country. Let's see how the medical approach to snake bike kits has actually changed over the years and how the most important component, anti-venom, is a powerful treatment against the deadliest of snake bites. Hi, I'm Amanda Cramp, Assistant Curator of Collections and Exhibits here at Turtle Bay Exploration Park. Australia and California have a lot in common, including geography and climate that provide a distinct environment for well-adapted plant and animal species to thrive. You can see many of these plants and animals here at Turtle Bay Exploration Park. Both Australia and California are home to many well-adapted species of venomous snakes. They may strike out of fear or in defense. That's why some folks carry snake bite kits. These kits belonged to G.R. Milford, a local man who spent much of his professional career outside surveying our region for the Northern California Power Company and PG&E. 
They are an excellent example of how objects and ideas change over time. For example, in Australia and elsewhere in the late 19th century, it wasn't uncommon for snake bite victims to be injected with ammonia or strychnine. Now we know that these are poison. Lucky for us, snake bite treatments have changed and snake bite kits have changed as well. Most modern kits now include a marker for you to circle the affected region and gauge swelling and other changes over time. This snake bite kit is from the 1920s. That's almost 100 years old. This is a tourniquet. It's meant to keep the venom from spreading further into the body, but we now know when the venom stays concentrated near the site of the bite, it destroys cells and nerves. Allowing it to spread dilutes the toxin, likely reducing tissue damage. This is a suction device or venom extractor. Most medical professionals agree that it is nearly impossible to cut deeply enough, quickly enough, and suck out enough venom to make a difference. This is a polyvalent antivenin kit from the 1940s. Antivenin neutralizes the toxins found in venom. If injected quickly enough, this treatment can save the victim's life or limb. Antivenin is made by injecting a horse, goat, or sheep with the venom from a specific type of snake. The animal's immune system creates antibodies to fight the foreign toxin. The blood is then drawn and purified to collect these antibodies, which is the basis for the antivenin. In North America, we have one polyvalent antivenin for all of the pit viper species. These include rattlesnakes, water moccasin, also called cottonmouth, and copperheads. The beautiful but venomous coral snake requires its own monovalent antivenin. Australia has several species-specific or monovalent antivenins and a polyvalent antivenin. A monovalent antivenin is for one species of snake, mono meaning one. A polyvalent antivenin is for several species of snake, poly meaning many. Today, antivenin is expensive, but most medical facilities keep it on site. If you're bitten by a venomous snake, the best course of action is to seek professional medical assistance immediately. They can test the bite site and determine whether antivenom is required and which type to use. They're also able to provide care in the event of an allergic reaction to the serum. So, whether you're going on a walkabout in Australia or hiking in beautiful Northern California, if you see a venomous snake in the wild, steer clear and tread carefully. How's it going? It's Roscoe here again. We're gonna give you guys a little test to see if you can pass for an Aussie using some of our words that you probably say all the time back there in the States. But I'll say the Australian word and you gotta try and pick what I'm talking about and I'll give you three options to choose from. You ready? Okay, let's get started. First up, the word is Arvo. Does it mean an aeroplane? The afternoon? or an avocado. Have you chosen one yet? The correct answer is afternoon. Next up, the word is mozzie. Does it mean a mosquito, a hamburger, or a small car? Have you got your answer yet? The correct answer is mosquito. The last Aussie word on our list is brolly. Does brolly mean a lollipop, a toothbrush, or an umbrella? You ready? The correct answer is umbrella. Next time you meet an Aussie, try using one of those words you learned today. Or better yet, come out for a visit. Hey Ray. That means goodbye. I'm Sharon Clay, curator of animal programs here at Turtle Bay Exploration Park. And I'm here to talk today a little bit about lorikeets. Lorikeets are types of parrots that are found in Austral Asia. Austral Asia is Australia and all the surrounding islands. Lorikeets are just one type of parrot. There are over 350 species of parrots found throughout the world. And of those, over 50 of them live in Australia alone. And when we think of parrots, we think of the ones usually in Central and South America, like Amazon parrots and macaws. There was a time where there were parrots right here in North America as well. Lorikeets 
Well, they're very specialized because they are nectar eaters. They have adapted a special bottle brush tongue, and that bottle brush gets into the flowers and pulls out the nectar. It's an extremely unique species, and it makes them a pollinator. Lorikeets, like all parrots, have a really difficult time, mainly due to habitat loss and well, the pet trade. People love to have them as pets, but frankly, folks, uh, it takes a very special person to have a parrot as a pet. They're very social, they're extremely loud, they're messy, and they live a very long time. Lorikeets can live over 20 years, and larger parrots, like Amazons, live 50 or 60. Get up to the macaws, and you're talking over 100 years. So you want to think twice before you bring one into your house. Here at Turtle Bay, we have our Parrot Playhouse. It's a walk-through aviary with lorikeets that will land right on you. And you'll get to see their bottle brush tongue up close and personal when you feed them nectar from your hand. We have 13 species of lorikeets in the Parrot Playhouse. Parrots are not all the same, just like all birds are not the same. Each one has unique qualities and adaptations that allows them to fill very important niches in nature. Turtle Bay's McConnell Arboretum Botanical Gardens features unique plants from all over the world. These diverse plants are all able to thrive right here due to a similar climate. Let's join Lisa and learn about some beautiful Australian plants and their amazing adaptations, as well as hear more about the distinct characteristics of the Mediterranean climate we share with other parts of the world. Hi, I'm Lisa Endicott and I'm here at the Botanical Gardens again at Turtle Bay. And today we're talking about Australian plants. Australian plants are wonderful for our climate. We're in a Mediterranean climate here in Redding, California, which is always on the west side of the continent and 30 to 45 degrees north and south of the equator. There are five Mediterranean climate zones around the world and they comprise only 2% of the world's land mass. So actually Mediterranean climates are really special. Australia is 22% of the Mediterranean climate and we're 10% of the Mediterranean climate and that's all of California west of the Sierra Nevadas. What those climates have in common is wet rainy winters mostly and hot dry summers for the most part except along the coastline of course. What the plants have in common is they have adaptations that allow them to grow very happily in those climates. Here in California, we have things like manzanita that has waxy leaves, they're called sclerophyll, that allows it to evade the sun. And as you can see, the leaves grow vertically, and that is another heat evading technique that the leaves have, and also, they have different kinds of photosynthesis where they are losing their water, not during the daytime, but at nighttime and gathering CO2 at night. This allows them to conserve water on a much, much bigger scale than most plants from temperate climates. From the Mediterranean basin, here we have the bay tree, Loris nobilis, and this is the actual bay leaves that that people put in their soup. And it has a very thick leaf and it has a thick waxy cuticle. And again, it's holding its leaves vertically to avoid sunlight and heat during the day. So very smart adaptations for these plants. One of my favorite things about Australian plants in particular is their variety of foliage. We have a eucalyptus cideroxylon behind me and that is red ironbark. And it is one of hundreds of species of eucalyptus throughout Australia. They have a really, really neat adaptation as do a lot of plants from the Mediterranean basin which have fire seasons just like we do. Underneath their bark, they have epicormic buds which will sprout after a fire. So if they lose all of these branches, there will be buds and branches that sprout from underneath the burned bark. All of these plants become invasives in the other countries because the climate is the same. So here in California, we have lots of Mediterranean plants that we see that bloom and are beautiful because we have a very similar climate. Hi everyone, I'm Lorraine.
Brenda with the Education Department at Turtle Bay Exploration Park. And today, we are gonna be talking about something called the Coriolis Effect. Have you ever wondered why storms spin in one direction in the Northern Hemisphere, and then the opposite direction in the Southern Hemisphere? The spin direction is due in large part to something called the Coriolis Effect. Simply put, the Coriolis Effect is the apparent force relative to the Earth's surface that causes the deflection of objects. Say you threw an object from Colorado up towards Montana. That object would actually land somewhere east, maybe all the way in Indiana, and that's due to the Coriolis effect. If Earth didn't rotate, winds would travel north or south, and that would depend on air temperature or pressure and latitude, whether you lived closer to the poles or to the equator. But Earth does spin on an axis, and the Coriolis effect causes winds in the northern hemisphere, like where we live in California, to deflect to the right, whereas in the southern hemisphere, the winds will deflect to the left, like in a location like Australia. A hurricane is made of a low pressure system. Winds will want to go towards the center to equalize the pressure. As the winds travel straight towards the center, they will deflect towards the right because of the Coriolis effect. On a radar, we would see these hurricanes spinning in a counterclockwise direction. In the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. Winds are deflected to the south, causing hurricanes to spin clockwise. Let's do a quick experiment. For this, you'll need a lazy Susan with a shallow bowl with water and some food coloring. Imagine that you are looking down at Earth at the North Pole and the outer edge of the plate is the equator. Begin spinning the Lazy Susan and add drops of food coloring. Stop the Lazy Susan and observe what's happening. You may notice that the water around the edge, the outer edge of the Lazy Susan is moving faster than the water at the center. This experiment shows us what the spinning motion is like in our atmosphere. The Coriolis effect happens at such a large scale that we can't see it here. At Turtle Bay, we are lucky to have some pretty awesome Australian animals, from Kinsa, our laughing kookaburra, to Daintree, our jungle carpet python. And of course, we can't forget about our playful and colorful lorikeets. Let's join Sharon and Adrian and dive into the similarities and differences of some other unique animals that call Northern California or Australia home. My name is Sharon Clay. I'm the curator of animal programs here at Turtle Bay Exploration Park. And I'm Adrian John, the assistant curator of the animal programs. Today we want to look a little bit at the comparison between Australia and Northern California. We may think of Australia as half a world away, but actually there are a lot of similarities between the two areas, mainly because both places have a temperate climate. And because it's so similar in its climate, the animals actually have similarities as well. Australia is known for marsupials. Let's say the wombat, one of my absolute favorite Australian marsupials. Wombats live in burrows underground. So if you are an animal that burrows like the wombat, you need to have special adaptations or special features that allow you to live this lifestyle. While a wombat is a marsupial, uh, take our badger here. It's also a ground burrowing animal and it's a mustelid, you know, related to animals like weasels and even otters. So quite different animals, but because they both burrow, they're gonna have similar adaptations. Both animals are able to squish down flatter so they can fit into burrows. They both have very long claws for digging underground. But some other features that are pretty cool is the hard plates that they have. So the badger digs down and they have a really hard head. So if rocks fall on them, well, they don't have any problems at all with that. Wombat has a bony plate on its backside because being a marsupial, they are going to have their babies in their pouch. They need a lot of protection around that part of their body. 
the wombat's pouch is backwards because when they're digging in the ground, they don't want to get any dirt inside that pouch. Australia has just a diverse amount of reptiles as we do here in the United States. For instance, take our boa constrictors. Boa constrictors are native to North and South America, but in Australia, they have pythons. The big difference is that pythons actually lay hard eggs, whereas boas give what's called live birth. And then we have our crocodilians. We have alligators. They're pretty neat, but down under, they have salties. The saltwater crocodile is actually the largest crocodile in the world. They can reach over 20 feet long. And in Australia, we know they have lots of deadly animals down there. And that includes some of the deadliest snakes in the world. In fact, the top 10 list all come from Australia. But the difference is that their venomous snakes are related to the cobras, whereas ours are all vipers. In fact, most of them are pit vipers. That means that they can actually sense the heat that mammals are giving off, like rattlesnakes. But in Australia, they don't actually use that sensing. They use mostly their eyesight and of course, that forked tongue. Parrots are found all over the world and a lot of species are even found in Australia. As a matter of fact, all species of cockatoo are found in Australia and the surrounding islands, just like the lorikeets. Even here in North America, we used to have parrot species that lived here in our climate as well. Other birds that you can find that are similar are kingfishers. Our kingfishers here are quite different than one of the famous kingfishers that you find in Australia. We just have the belted kingfisher. That long beak allows them to dive into the water and come up with fish but the largest kingfishers in the world are found in Australia, and those are the laughing kookaburra. <laughs> the laughing kookaburra, however, lives in the forest, so they're not eating fish. They use that beak of theirs to fly down and grab lizards, rodents, and venomous snakes. Australian animals may seem really diverse to us, but all it takes is a glance outside to realize we have just as much diversity here in Northern California. Next time you go out for a hike or even out your door, make sure you take a peek at all those animals out there and see just what makes them unique. Hi, I'm Julia Cronin, Curator of Collections and Exhibits here at Turtle Bay Exploration Park, and today I'm at the Sundial Bridge, which really is a giant sundial. On the summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year, people flock here to see the shadow from the giant gnomon travel across the hour markers. Not only is this the longest day of the year, here in the U.S., we consider the solstice, which falls on June 20th or 21st, to be the first day of summer in our seasonal calendar. In other regions of the Northern Hemisphere, it is traditionally considered to be midsummer. Here in Redding, California, in our Mediterranean climate, we just know that it's hot. But if you were to hop on a plane here on June 20th and fly to Sydney, Australia, you'd better pack a coat because you would be landing there on the winter solstice. That's right, the months we associate with long days and summer vacation are exactly the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. Summer and winter aren't months of the year, they're seasons. So just why do we have seasons? It's because the Earth is tilted on its axis. So for half the year, the Northern Hemisphere is facing the sun and gets longer, hotter days. And then for the other half of the year, the Southern Hemisphere is toward the sun and the days are longer and hotter. If you live near the equator, your days are a little more equal throughout the year. But if you live near the poles, the length of your day is affected greatly by the season. So in six months, when we're all bundled up, drinking hot chocolate and putting up our holiday decorations, our friends in Australia will also be getting ready for their traditional December holidays and New Year's too. Maybe with a barbecue on the beach, an ice cold drink. Unfortunately, both Northern California and Australia have suffered from destructive wildfires, but progress has been made as knowledge, resources, and even firefighters have been shared locally and internationally. Let's join Katie and learn more about the hardworking heroes that keep our homes, forests, and wildlife safe as they prevent, manage, and extinguish wildfires. And in some pretty amazing ways, from planes dropping fire retardant to smoke jumpers parachuting into the heat of the action. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Katie and I'm an educator here at Turtle Bay Exploration Park. I'm standing here in our mill building next to our Smoke Jumper Interactive, where visitors can try their hand at parachuting to the ground beneath them, just as a smoke jumper would. Smoke jumping is just one of the many aerial firefighting techniques used to combat forest fires from the skies above. Aerial firefighting is critically important when vehicles such as fire engines cannot access areas quickly and easily. But how do just planes and parachuting firefighters control massive spreading wildfires? Before we get into these techniques, it's important to remember how fires burn. It all comes down to three factors, heat, oxygen, and fuel. The more heat that is in an environment, the easier it is for fires to start and the hotter those fires will burn. Also, the presence of oxygen via wind and air movement allow burning flames to stay lit. The last factor is fuel, any combustible or flammable material that could catch fire. In wildlands and forests, fuel can be dried grass, brush, or trees. Low moisture in environments can also increase flammability. By removing heat, oxygen, and fuel from an area, firefighters can control how fires burn and spread. So imagine a wildfire in an extremely remote area where fire engines cannot access quickly. This is where aerial firefighting is key. Planes packed with water or fire retardants can fly over, deploying chemicals that remove heat and oxygen from an area while adding nutrients to replenish the soil. Smoke jumpers ascending into surrounding areas using tools like chainsaws, axes, and shovels to take down brush. They're working hard creating boundaries with fire lines to remove fuel and vegetation, leaving areas of bare soil to stop fire spread in its tracks. Eventually, paths and roads would be built to bring more ground support to the areas, allowing fire engines, water tenders, and fire crews to continue their work. As you can imagine, all these techniques require specialized equipment and expertly trained firefighting personnel. Here in the U.S., multiple agencies are prepped and ready for a fire season each year, but we're not the only area that deals with the unique obstacles that comes with seasonal wildfires. Similarly, parts of Australia also faces seasonal wildfires. When wildland fires become aggressive and tumultuous, sharing resources and knowledge becomes necessary for success. Firefighting agencies from the US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia have worked together for years, sending equipment and personnel around the world to combat wildland fires. Recently, both the North State and Australia have suffered unprecedented wildfires that required significant efforts and collaboration. In August 2018, over 100 Australian firefighters came to Northern California to help battle fires. Likewise, over 200 American firefighting professionals were sent to Australia in early 2020. Between years of fire suppression, human impacts, and climate change, the risks of wildland fires will remain in the US and Australia alike. But by working together, sharing resources and knowledge, the chances of fire containment and prevention soar conserving the natural beauty of our world to enjoy for generations. Well, that brings us to the end of our episode. Let's see if you got the correct answers to our trivia questions. Number one, the two reasons snakes strike are out of fear or self-defense. Number two, lorikeets can live over 20 years long. Finally, when it's summer in Reading, in Australia, the season is winter. Thank you for joining us. Turtle Bay is a nonprofit organization supported by generous viewers like you. Please visit turtlebay.org forward slash donate to support all our wonderful programs that help you explore our world. Until next time on Turtle Bay TV. Turtle Bay TV is made possible by Voya Financial.